specific uh, verticals and end markets uh, and what it means for you here at PMMI. Um, I know that a lot of you are uh, recurring members and are familiar with uh, both the report that PM, uh, PMMI puts together and also our terminology and methodology and work here at ITR, uh, but for the sake of you that are first-time viewers or first-time listeners um, or who are just coming back for the first time in a long time, uh, before I dive into the guts of the report, I'd like to go over some of the terminology and methodology that we use here at ITR um, because the, the lingo and the terms can be a little confusing at first, and I want to make sure that we're all on the same page as we move forward. Um, and now, Rebecca, we can progress the slide. Okay, is it showing up on your end, Chris? Um, no, I'm still getting a loading screen on my side, uh, Rebecca, but I have a copy on my computer that I can move through if you want to just walk forward with me. Sure. Great. So I've included this slide as a kind of uh, shotgun intro to what we do at, here at ITR and also uh, some of the terms and methods that we use, as I mentioned before. Uh, I encourage you to uh, come back to this slide at any time uh, when you're either uh, viewing this presentation or listening to it at a different time. Um, if you are at all confused about any of the uh, metrics that I'm using or what exactly I'm referencing. So first, there are four primary metrics that we use here at ITR to determine uh, where your business or where an industry is within the business cycle. First, we have our moving totals or our moving averages. We use the 3 MMT or the 3 month moving total or the 12 MMT or the 12 month moving total. We also refer to these obviously uh, as quarterly totals or annual totals. Um, we use moving totals when the metric that we're looking at uh, makes logical sense to be summed up, added together. Um, things such as sales, revenue, profits, or units shipped. Uh, however, we use the moving averages when it doesn't make sense logically to use an arithmetic sum, um, for example, interest rates uh, or indexes or percentiles. So again, we have our three-month moving total, which is simply the uh, sum of the most recent three months of data, uh, and the 12-month moving total, which is the sum of the most recent 12 months of data. We then also have our rates of change analogs for both our 3 MMT and our 12 MMT. You'll hear me refer to these either as the 312 or quarterly rate of change or the 1212 or annual rate of change. Uh, rates of change are the primary metrics we use for determining where we are in the business cycle because it gives us an idea of progressive gain or progressive decline as opposed to getting lost in the nominal uh, and sometimes trendless raw data. The 312 or quarterly growth rate is simply the most recent 3 MMT compared to the 3 MMT one year ago. So the most recent uh, quarter of data, third quarter data or second quarter data right now compared to the second quarter data of 2016. Similarly, the annual rate of change or the year-over-year -year growth rate uh, is simply the most recent 12 MMT compared to the 12 MMT from one year prior. As I mentioned before, rates of change are our primary metric for determining where we are in the business cycle. Uh, and you'll hear me consistently throughout this report mentioning the four different phases of the business cycle as we define it here at ITR. You can see down at the bottom of my screen we have this four-colored stylized sign curve. And this is our theoretical representation of the business cycle as we define it. In the bottom left-hand quadrant, in blue, you can see uh, we have Phase A, Recovery. We call this Phase A, Recovery, and I like to think of it as the light at the end of the tunnel, because this is when your 12-12 is below the zero line, so you're declining on a year-over-year -year basis. However, you're moving up toward that zero line, so things are becoming progressively less and less bad as we move forward. Hence, you're still in the tunnel, but you can see the light coming ahead of you. Once your 12-12 rises over that zero line, we transition to phase B, accelerating growth. Again, this is defined quantitatively as when the 12-12 is above the zero line and it is rising. So every month you're growing at a faster and faster clip. Uh, obviously, this is the best phase of the business cycle to be in. Uh, and this is where you run into a lot of structural or managerial tasks that you have to solve. 
uh, tightening inventory, rising prices, uh, shortened deadlines, things of uh, that nature. Then when your 12.12 reaches a peak and it begins to decline, but it's still above the zero line, you enter phase C, slower growth. Uh, I like to consider this phase C because it's the cautionary phase of the business cycle. Uh, you're still above the year ago level, you're still expanding your business, so the industry is still expanding on a year-over-year -year basis. Uh, however, that pace of growth is slowing and beginning to decline. Once your 12-12 falls below the zero line, you fall into phase D, recession. Uh, I know uh, none of you likely need a formal description of phase D recession as it's often on our minds, especially during troubling times like we had last year. Uh, but it's important to note that this, as I mentioned before, is a stylized or theoretical model of the business cycle. Uh, in real life, in real industry, we don't always see all four uh, cycles of the, or phases of the business cycle um, move one after the other in a nice fashion like this. Instead, we could have what's considered a soft landing. Uh, this is where you're in phase C, your 12-12 is declining, but it reaches a bottom, it reaches a trough and transitions directly back to phase B without declining on a year-over-year -year basis. Again, obviously, uh, the ideal form of the business cycle that we all want to see all the time. However, we know that's not always possible, especially uh, during times of economic duress or recession, for example, in the 2008, 2009, 2010 time period, uh, we can have the opposite happen with uh, what we describe as a hard landing. This is when you're in phase A, recovery of the business cycle. Your 12-12 is rising. You're starting to see that light at the end of the tunnel. But before you transition into phase B, that year-over-year -year rise, you reach a peak and fall directly back into phase D, recession. So throughout this report, when you hear me mentioning phase A, B, C, and D, um, in your mind, think back to this uh, little sign curve we have if at any point you forget uh, you know, the, the technical definition of what those different phases of the business cycle are. It's also important to note that while we look at the 12-12 in determining where a business or an industry is in the business cycle, which phase it's in, uh, it's also important to realize that the 3-12, the quarterly growth rate, being a more reactive growth rate, acts as a leading indicator to your company sales. So imagine that your 12-12 is falling toward that zero line, you're in a late phase C, and you're nervous that you may fall into phase D, recession. Obviously, a lot hinges on calling whether growth is going to continue and you're going to have a soft landing, or you are going to fall into phase D recession and you have to start you know, perhaps tightening your budget, tightening your belt, uh, and dealing with that period of decline. Getting that right can be very important in the long-term growth and health of either an industry or your company as a whole. So if you're in that late phase C, for example, and you see that your quarterly growth rate falls below uh, the year ago level and is declining on a quarterly basis, that's some strong statistical evidence that your 12-12 is going to follow in the phase B recession in the next one to two quarters. Similarly, if your 12-12 is falling toward that zero line, but your 3-12 quarterly growth rate ticks up and begins to rise again, once it upward passes that 12-12, uh, that's a good indicator that you're going to have a nice soft landing or very brief and mild recession and transition back to that phase B accelerating growth trend. Um, so as we go through this report, we'll be looking at a lot of different leading indicators for your company uh, and for the economy as a whole. Uh, but remember that you don't always need leading indicators for short-term decision-making processes because your 312, uh, if you break out your sales on a quarterly or on a rate of change basis, your 312 actually acts as a de facto leading indicator of between three to six months for your 12-12. So that's very important to keep in mind when judging the near-term health of an industry or of your company. And then, uh, Rebecca, we can move on to the next slide. Here we have U.S. industrial production. For those who have been with us for a while, you know that this is one of our primary benchmarks for the U.S. economy as a whole. It comprises three main components. Uh, mining, manufacturing, and public utilities. Uh, you can see that throughout the majority of 2016 and even late 2015, we were in um, a relatively significant industrial recession in the U.S., primarily driven by the oil patch bust and the resulting decline in commodity prices. 
this put a lot of downward negative pricing pressures on companies uh, and they really cut back on their uh, investment and production levels. As of last quarter, you know that we were forecasting a growth period of accelerating growth in the second half of 2017. Uh, into 2018, followed by a period of slower but still healthy growth throughout 2018. Uh, I'm excited to say with the most recent data that's come out, um, we have developed into a phase A, phase B trend. We are right on the year ago level at a 12-12 of 0.0%, uh, funnily enough. However, that 312, that quarterly growth rate, is seeing significant growth. So we know that there's plenty of upside business cycle pressures to get us into that nice phase B transition during the second half of 2017. And we expect to see that imminently in the industrial uh, economy. But without just taking the numbers for it, uh, and you can see that we also have our forecast point down here for you. Uh, you can see that uh, as of 2017, we expect about 0.5% growth year over year. Uh, and by the end of 2018, we expect to be down just about 0.7%. So that growth should persist into the late third quarter, early fourth quarter of 2018. But we don't have to take the numbers for it. We can look at what the leading indicator evidence says. Here we have the ITR leading indicator. This is a proprietary uh, index developed by us here at ITR uh, that is built to lead the industrial economy by between 12 and 16 months. So it gives us about a year to a year and a quarter of forward-looking uh, forecasting power for the industrial economy. You can see, again, it's up. We have those business cycle pressures based on our 312 and the ITR uh, leading indicator, we know that that phase B transition is imminent. You can go to the next slide, Rebecca. Here we have U.S. industrial production compared to the U.S. total industry capacity utilization rate. So the percentage of all of the productive capital in America that is being used at a given time. Again, you can see that that utilization rate is rising. We are stressing our equipment. We are spooling up. We are getting to make more. Again, very positive uh, leading indicator signaling uh, and positive business cycle pressures for U.S. industrial production and anyone who uh, follows the overall economic trends of the industrial economy as well. And we can jump down to the next slide, Rebecca. Again, another uh, benchmark leading indicator that I'm sure uh, many of you follow and that you uh, hear mentioned both here uh, at ITR and also in the news, U.S. Purchasing Managers Index developed by the Institute for Supply and Management. This is a survey of current economic activity sent out to uh, many major purchasing managers at uh, industrial factories of all sizes throughout the U.S. Uh, it's important to stress that it is a survey of current economic activity and current sales and inventories as opposed to something speculative that they might get wrong or might be driven more by a gut feeling. Because of this, uh, it acts as a very robust leading indicator for the U.S. industrial economy by about 9 to 14 months, so 3 to 4, 3 to 5 quarters. You can see some significant rise up until the last quarter or so, uh, which does signal that 12-12 accelerating growth trend for U.S. industrial production uh, into the first quarter of 2018. Importantly, however, you can also see that it has curved over since the last report. It's made that transition to phase C, which supports our expectation of growth beginning to slow and diminish um, in the second to third quarter of 2018. The important part about looking at these leading indicators is that it allows us to, uh, instead of relying just on theory or just on a gut feeling, actually apply a quantitative method to judging or benchmarking on a month-to-month -month basis whether our overall economic outlook is correct. Uh, and that allows us to plan for future activity. And again, as we've seen from these three benchmark leading indicators, uh, our general outlook of accelerating growth into 2018, followed by slower growth throughout the year, uh, still seems to be holding. And Rebecca, we can jump to the next slide. Here we have U.S. non-defense capital new orders, uh, excluding uh, aircraft, kind of a mouthful to say. Uh, but basically all this is, is this is B2B activity. This is business investment. Uh, you know, the sphere of the economy that most of you at PMMI, uh, you know, live and breathe in on a daily basis. 
So you can see that it's down uh, about 1.5 percentage points on an annual basis, uh, but it is in that phase A recovery trend, and it's expected to uh, transition to year-over-year -year rise uh, in late 2017 throughout the majority of 2018. Uh, again, the majority of the weakness that we saw over the past year and a half or so was primarily commodity driven, um, where purchasing managers saw those really weak returns on investment, uh, and because of that, didn't want to expand their capital fleet. They weren't buying new machinery, new uh, equipment, new trucks. Uh, instead, they were essentially making do with what they had until the economic environment seemed more favorable and they could get more bang for their buck. Uh, luckily, as I mentioned before, we're seeing a lot of those industrial headwinds receding uh, and we expect B2B activity and likely activity for most of you at PMMI uh, to improve in late 2017 and 2018 as a result. And then Rebecca, we can jump to the next slide. Shown here we have U.S. gross domestic product, GDP. The reason I included this is because uh, it's the most holistic capture of economic activity within a country. Uh, it tries to capture uh, literally all of the economic activity, all of the sales, all of the purchasing, all of the production that happens within an economy uh, to give one metric that helps describe what's going on. And you can see that we're currently in a phase B accelerating growth trend up about 1.7% uh, year over year. That's uh, a very healthy growth rate, nothing to write home about, nothing to jump with joy about. Uh, but you can see we do expect to accelerate into mid-2018 uh, before slowing through 2018 and just about kissing the zero line in 2019. And the reason this is important to note is that despite a lot of the industrial headwinds we've seen, a lot of the weak commodity prices, um, almost paradoxically, those have been very healthy trends uh, for uh, a lot of the U.S. economy. And we've seen persistent growth since the 2008-2009 recession. And Rebecca, we can jump forward a slide. And why are those weak commodity prices, low gas prices, low oil prices positive? Well, you can see here that the U.S. consumer is king when it comes to GDP. Uh, personal consumption in the U.S. makes up two-thirds of overall economic activity. So when gas prices fall, when steel prices fall, when we have a deflationary pricing environment, when you're getting uh, less money for the machinery you sell, ultimately that's tough for industry, but it's very good for consumers. It can help keep the economy afloat. These strong uh, consumer trends that we've seen, uh, you know, fairly strong employment, low interest rates, uh, you know, uh, healthy borrowing costs, we expect those to persist into 2019 and to be some of the major drivers of economic growth that we're looking at in the U.S. moving forward. Because of that, while we are expecting an industrial recession in 2019, albeit a mild one, um, industries that are more closely tied to uh, consumer activity are going to be relatively insulated throughout the 2018 time period uh, as the ONG patch recovers, for example. But moving into 2019, a turn down in consumer activity is actually going to be one of the major causal drivers of this recession that we're expecting. So get your growth in now over the next 16 to 18 months. But moving into 2019, if you're closely tied to U.S. consumer activity uh, or you have clients who are closely tied to U.S. consumer activity, um, that's going to be a warning sign. Moving to the second to third, possibly even fourth quarter of 2019, depending on where you're positioned within the business cycle. And Rebecca, we can move on to the next slide. You can see here we have a, what I consider a spaghetti chart here of um, a variety of different primary metals and very important commodity prices uh, within the U.S. industrial economy. And you can see that across the board there above the year ago level, zinc 34%, lead 25%, copper 19.8%, aluminum 18.6%, you get the picture. Those prices have largely recovered from their drop in 2016 and late 2015. Um, but you can see that, that 12, those growth rates have turned over. They're still above the year ago level, but that growth is slowing. And that's important. Uh, if you were here to listen to us speak um, during the fourth quarter of 2016 or the first quarter of 2017, um, we talked about the rising prices that we expected and that we're seeing now. 
and mentioned trying to uh, beat that trend, lock in your prices, uh, do everything you can to get those long-term purchasing plans in place in order to hedge against this rise. Um, and that was a great strategy uh, during the first half of the year, not so much moving forward into 2017. You can see as those prices turn over, we've already realized the majority of the pricing gains for the major commodities that we expect to see through the remainder of 2017 and into early 2018. Uh, so while the environment will likely uh, remain steady and remain above the year ago level, it's not going to be accelerating like we saw in the first half of the year. And Rebecca, we can go to the next slide. Another positive trend within the U.S. economy, here we have U.S. private sector employment. Uh, if you read the Wall Street Journal or the New York Times uh, or any major news that reports on uh, economic and financial trends, you'll know that we're seeing uh, very low, almost historically low, unemployment rates um, really across the country. Uh, and that's a positive sign for the U.S. economy. It means people are getting back to work. It means that, uh, you, you know, that labor market is tightening and we're absorbing a lot more people, a lot more human capital into the production process, which bodes well for growth over the next year. You can see private sector employment growth is up 1.7%. Job openings are up 2.4%. Uh, and what's important to notice is when we see job openings outpace employment growth, that means that that labor market is tightening. Essentially, demand is outpacing supply. So while this is a positive trend for the U.S. consumer that's ultimately uh, resulting in, uh, obviously, more jobs, more money in your pocket, more purchasing power, um, it's also resulting in a rising quit rate. Uh, as demand for labor increases and kind of surpasses what we can uh, put out with the labor pool, people are feeling much more confident that if they were to quit their job right now, if I were to leave ITR Economics, I could find a job relatively easily that might even pay better because of that increasing demand for labor. Because of that, one of the big problems that we're going to look at over the next 12 to 18 months, that period of prosperity that we're seeing now and expecting, is going to be managing not only rising commodity prices, not only your bottom line, um, but ultimately your labor force as well. Uh, as you all know, you simply can't be productive if your turnover rate keeps increasing. If you're uh, hiring people as fast as you're losing them, you're simply not going to be able to churn out the amount of product that you want to. Uh, there's a lot you can do to mitigate uh, high employee turnover. Uh, the most obvious and often the most unpopular one is to increase your wages. Uh, you know, higher prices make people more likely to stick around. But also you can look for little cost of living or uh, quality of living increases for your employees that don't necessarily impact your bottom line directly. Um, think about giving them uh, flexible hours, maybe uh, 10 to 6 instead of 9 to 5 if that works with your production process. More flexible dress codes. Don't make them come into work in that collared shirt and those nice shoes. Let them wear their jeans and their, uh, you know, comic t-shirts if that's acceptable. Uh, perhaps look at giving um, more flexible time off, increased vacation pay. Most of these will incur costs to you in some form, but normally not as directly or as significantly as you would expect to see if you just jacked up your wages. And Rebecca, we can jump to the next slide. And ultimately, as I mentioned before, when we see commodity prices rise, when we see a tightening labor market and rising labor costs, we see inflation. Um, something we haven't seen a lot of in recent years, but you can see here that we have the U.S. Consumer Price Index in orange, and then the U.S. Producer Price Index in blue. Uh, the Producer Price Index is um, what most of you will feel, and that essentially is a pure hit to your bottom line. Uh, that is profitability going down the drain if you keep your prices constant. Uh, you can see that producer prices are slowing marginally, but they're up 2.2% year, uh, year over year right now. Um, so again, definitely inflationary pressures that are expected to stick around uh, and that are going to be directly hindering your profitability over this period of rise uh, if you don't find a way to mitigate it. And Rebecca, we can jump to the next slide. Here you can see that we have the Federal Open Market Committee, that's the Fed, the Federal Reserve, the Central Bank, uh, their member interest rate projections. This is a poll of the members on the FOMC. 
uh, basically asking them where they expect benchmark, in, uh, benchmark interest rates uh, to be in 2017, 2018, 2019, and then just in the, the vague, nebulous, long term. Think 5, 10, 15 years for that. You can see each one of these dots is a member projection. In red, we have our most recent projections, and in blue, we have last quarter's projections. And you can see that they're right on top of each other. We expect to see 1.5 to maybe 1.75% uh, interest rates uh, by the end of 2017, rising to the mid-2, and ultimately 3% by 2019 and belong. And, you know, why do we care? Interest rates often seem kind of a, uh, again, a, a nebulous, difficult to wrap your mind around financial construct. But essentially what this means is that the Federal Reserve, the U.S. Central Bank, is saying that inflationary pressures are not going and the cost of doing business, the cost of borrowing money, has to increase as we move forward to deal with that. Uh, because of that, we want you to expect uh, not to see as uh, an accommodating uh, lending environment as we've enjoyed since the 2008-2009 recession um, in the years to come. And you want to factor that into your large capital purchases. If you're on the fence about expanding uh, new warehouses, um, new distribution channels, new machinery, uh, 2017 is a better time than 2018, 2018 is a better time than 2019, if you're going to be financing this uh, through lending. Something to keep in mind as we move forward is going to characterize the overall economic trends within the U.S. Uh, and likely within most of the major developing nations abroad as well. And Rebecca, we can jump to the next slide. So again, a period of economic prosperity that we're entering into, especially if you're tied to the B2B sector or the industrial sector. About 18 months, so a year and a half of strong rise, followed by a mild downturn in 2019. Uh, again, a lot of positive indications in the leading indicators that we're seeing, uh, and a lot of good stuff coming out of not just the White House, but the economy in general. People are spending money, people are happy, people are confident, and that's enough to grease the bearings of the U.S. economic machine uh, moving forward for at least the next year and a half. However, there are lingering concerns. Uh, historically strong dollar, that's going to hurt exports and make domestic uh, product less competitive. If you sell into Mexico, if you sell into Canada, if you sell into Asia or Europe, you're going to be facing people who are essentially charging less money for their product and undercutting you just because of the strength of the U.S. dollar. And that's something you're going to have to grapple with for the foreseeable future. Um, the fundamentals are there. The dollar isn't likely going to weaken significantly against most of our major trading partners over at least the next one to two years. Anyone who sells into verticals who are very reliant on uh, commodity prices, think like oil, natural gas, steel, copper, uh, while we're looking at general rising trends, there's going to be a lot of fluctuations uh, in the near term, a lot of volatility in that rising trend. Uh, so especially if you're selling into South America, for example, uh, there's going to be a lot of uncertainty, a lot of weakness, and you might have to take strides to make your products more attractive or to mitigate or assuage some of that uncertainty if you want to continue doing business at the pace that you are now and realize your economic potential during this period of prosperity. Uh, a more long-term problem, China's growth going forward. China is the second largest economy in the world, right after the U.S., but still significantly behind us. Uh, and there's been a lot of fears that their economic growth numbers have been um, artificially propped up in some manner by uh, essentially useless government investment. Um, in the past, there's the classic uh, horror story or cautionary story uh, of the Chinese government funding entire cities uh, to boost those economic numbers, to get steel moving on the railroad tracks, to get workers back to work, um, and then three years later there's no one living there because the simple market fundamentals aren't there. Uh, nothing definitive that we've seen in the data going forward, but especially, again, if you sell into China, uh, something to keep in mind that their growth rates may not be as robust and you may want to temper your expectations in that market in the long term. Finally, uh, lingering global uncertainty. 2016 has, and 2017 has really been a uh, roller coaster of a year when it comes to political economics. Um, we've seen Brexit, we've seen political upsets in the U.S., 
Um, there is many talks of uh, protectionism, not just within the U.S., but within um, Germany, France, the U.K., uh, some, some of the major economic drivers of the European bloc. Uh, and protectionism, while it has near-term gains, um, Economically, history isn't on its side. It tends to lead to uh, decreased global competitiveness. It tends to lead to increased prices domestically and generally a pullback in spending uh, because ultimately economic growth over the past 80, 90 years, the period really since about the end of World War II, has largely been driven by companies focus, or countries excuse me, focusing on what they do best. The U.S. does high tech. Uh, Norway does oil, Middle East does oil, China does uh, bulk manufacturing. By doing that, it's essentially one hand washing the other, where we get to trade in those services and ultimately enjoy lower costs for all of our goods and services throughout the world. Um, any major uh, divergences from that uh, globalist policy that we've seen over the past decades such as a repeal of NAFTA, um, could be detrimental, especially to anyone who wants to operate outside of the U.S. as well as inside of the U.S. Uh, again, something to keep in mind for your long-term planning, uh, but right now it looks like NAFTA will be redesigned to the net benefit of most of the countries in North America. Um, we've seen political victories in France and Germany that suggest uh, the EU open market will continue, uh, and ultimately that this period of economic prosperity and economic growth that we're looking forward to through 2018 isn't going to be hindered by uh, any nationalist movements. Again, just a threat that we have to monitor as we go forward. And then we can jump forward to the next slide. And now we've prepared for you some management objectives to take in 2017 and into the first half of 2018 as well. Uh, again, for those of you who are new to ITR, who are new to PMMI, who are here for the first time, uh, take note, write this down, keep it in the back of your mind. For those of you who have been listening to us in the first half of 2017, uh, you'll notice that you probably already have this written down because our overall macroeconomic perspective, our expectations of growth in 2017 and 2018 have not changed and neither have our management objectives. First and foremost, you can see it bolded and underlined. Know where you and your markets are in the business cycle. Just because you know what the economy is doing doesn't mean you know what your relationship to the economy is. And that ties down to our last and otherwise most important bullet here. Follow the must-watch leading indicators, PMI, ITRLI, housing, bond yields, and work with your team uh, to find out where you are in the production cycle in relation to those primary leading indicators. This is the only way that you can truly and fully prepare for uh, the business cycle as we define it moving forward over the next three years. Continue to budget for growth during the next 18 months uh, and invest in operational efficiencies. Train up your employees, uh, buy those machinery. Your productivity uh, over the next three years has to, has to at least match wage and price increases. Um, otherwise, you're going to be enjoying what we call profitless prosperity, uh, a period of growth where you raise your top line but don't manage to raise your bottom line because inflation and higher wages are eating into that profitability. Uh, and that's really what we expect to see for a lot of people who aren't uh, paying attention to the business cycle, paying attention to the macroeconomic trends over the next year and a half. And finally, uh, in ensure that your employee development doesn't stagnate. We see that quick rate rising. We see laborers of all skills are in demand. Um, Make sure you are satisfying your employees, listen to what they want, and give them what they need to stay for you and increase that productivity. And Rebecca, we can jump to the next slide. Now that we have our uh, kind of broad stroke economic update for the U.S. economy as a whole, we're going to move into the forecasts uh, that you receive on a quarterly basis with the PMI quarterly report and talk about some of the trends that we're seeing within some of the smaller verticals and smaller industries within the U.S. Here we have food production, U.S. food and foods preparation production. Uh, currently up 2.6% uh, year over year, and has just transitioned to a phase C slower growth trend. You can see that we expect about six to seven months 
um, of that decelerating trend, that 12-12 moving downward and growth slowing. But most importantly, we are expecting one of those nice soft landings based on the rising wages, the rising employment, really uh, all the strong consumer trends that put money in people's pockets. Uh, we see historically that when U.S. consumers have money, they eat, and they eat out, and they buy food. Uh, and we expect that to bolster this industry over the next three years. You can see on the left side of this chart, we have the 12-month moving averages uh, for this index. And you can see that despite the period of slower growth, it really is moving up into the right. And if you're involved in uh, the food, food preparation or food packaging verticals, uh, that's good news for you over the next three years. We can jump to the next slide. Here, uh, related, we have beverages, coffee, and tea production. Uh, when we say beverages, we also include um, soda, we include liquid flavorings, and also uh, beer and beer brewing. You can see that we're up 4.6% year over year, uh, also in that phase C transition. Um, but again, we expect a soft landing and a very similar growth profile that we saw in overall food production. Um, again, you can see that 12 MMA on the left side of this chart moving up into the right, sig signaling that demand will rise consistently for the next three years, um, as is really the norm for this industry, except during periods of severe recession, like we see all the way over there on the left uh, in late 2007 and 2008. When it comes down to uh, beer, uh, the beer industry and uh, brewing in general, uh, we really do see that Americans love beer and they're buying it and that's showing in the numbers. Uh, one important trend to keep track of though is the Craft Brewery Microbrew Association. Uh, the American Craft Beer Association as of 2014 reported that craft brewing uh, gained as much as 11% market share in the overall beer industry in the U.S. It's very significant. So imagine one out of 10 beer dollars sold are craft brewing. This is a up-and-coming uh, industry that with millennial tastes for uh, smaller kind of homegrown, locally grown, more regional goods is likely going to continue to see some uh, significant upward momentum in the coming years. Uh, especially as millennials move into more senior positions and have more money to spend on the more expensive goods they prefer. Uh, so having it be a relatively new industry, consider targeting the more uh, local or regional uh, producers and distributors if you're involved in canning and bottling. Uh, that's often an untapped uh, growth industry that we've seen. And then we can jump into the next slide, which is U.S. pharmaceutical and medical device production. Uh, down 1.5% year over year. Uh, it's in a phase D recessionary trend right now. Uh, but you can see that there has been some lateral movement here. Uh, we don't expect to see much more decline in that 12-12 and are expecting a transition to phase A recovery uh, in the second half of 2017. Uh, however, we do expect to finish the year down 1.5% uh, before accelerating up to not quite 2% in 2018. And we can jump forward to the next slide. Here we have U.S. personal care products production. Uh, I kind of lump these together in my mind. Again, as we saw with food and beverage production, these are two relatively um, closely related industries that both rely to some extent uh, upon the state of healthcare in the U.S. in general. Again, you can see that we expect a phase A transition over the next uh, year and we will finish 2017 down about 2.1% year over year before accelerating again through 2018, becoming up 2.2% year over year. We see uh, with the news on the ACA, Obamacare, uh, coming out of Washington in the recent days, um, it looks like Obamacare is around to stay, uh, at least for the near term. Um, as the Republican Party didn't quite manage to get the votes they needed to repeal it. Uh, and now I'm not concerned uh, in this context with whether Obamacare is good for the U.S. or bad for the U.S. or if we should do something else, but ultimately compared to the alternatives that have been kicked around, uh, the, Amer the American Care Act, uh, Obamacare, looks like it will ensure more Americans than the alternatives. And again, despite the overarching positivity or negativity of that, more insured Americans 
means uh, more drugs. It means more trips to the, uh, to the dentist, to the hospital. It means more medical devices. It means insurance will pick up um, more goods that you can get at Rite Aid or at CVS. Uh, and that will help to bolster this industry uh, over the next three years and ensure that the recession we're moving into in 2019 um, really doesn't fall any further than the trough we are in right now. So while we do expect some growth on a yearly basis in 2018, um, over the next three years, uh, you can really expect these industries to remain relatively stagnant and relatively steady. Then we can jump down to the next slide where we have U.S. chemicals and cleaning products production. Currently up 1.6% year over year in a phase B accelerating growth trend. Uh, we expect that trend to persist into early 2018, finishing 2017 up 2.2% year over year um, before slowing to uh, the low single digit of 0.4% growth as of 2018. We do expect a mild recession in 2019. You can see where our forecast error bar is kind of uh, just kiss the zero line and move along it, uh, you can see that any recession that we see is likely to be just around 0% growth and will likely be a period of uh, slower growth as opposed to feeling like a true recession that we saw about 10 years ago. We can jump to the next slide. We have durables, hard goods, components, and parts production. Uh, this is another one of those uh, economic series that sounds like a bunch of gibberish, but essentially what durables, hard goods, components, and parts production is, uh, is anything that is ex expected to last more than two or three years that you buy, either as a consumer or as a business. Uh, this includes things such as computer parts and electronics, um, household appliances, consumer goods like uh, jewelry, home goods, cutlery, instruments, and toys, uh, and auto parts and accessories. So you can see it's a very broad uh, economic indicator and there are a lot of different trends going on with it during any different period. You can see that it has recently transitioned uh, to 0.4% or to phase B with that soft landing up uh, about half a percent year over year and we expect it to accelerate through 2017 finishing the year up not quite 2.5% before slowing through 2018. Uh, again, uh, recessionary pressures are going to be mixed in 2019 and are going to be dependent really upon where your specific verticals are uh, oriented within this market. To uh, kind of explicate how there are uh, various different trends going on within the industry, uh, household appliances are currently up 5.7% or in a slowing growth trend. Um, computers, parts, and electronics goods are up 3.1% year over year, um, while auto parts productions are currently uh, in phase B, accelerating growth, and are up 6.5% year over year. Uh, all three of these are likely to be uh, growth segments moving into at least late, late uh, 2018. So if you're positioned to take use of or make use of growth in these verticals, uh, this really is a time of positivity where you want to start thinking about expansion and about what is next within your production cycle. And finally, now that we've talked about some of the, uh, and we can move on to the next slide, by the way, Rebecca. Now that we've talked about some of the uh, overarching trends within the U.S. and some of the microeconomic vertical level trends that we're seeing, I want to extrapolate that out to the, US, or to the world as a whole and take a brief look at what we're seeing in various different parts of the international economy. Uh, you can see here that we have a variety of global leading indicators. Uh, in those blue words, you can see uh, the OECD, that's some of the largest developed countries, um, the five major Asian economies, Brazil, Canada, China, India, Japan, all major economic players on the international scene, all of their leading indicators are moving up and to the right. Uh, they are signaling positivity, they are signaling uh, diminished headwinds against international trade, and that's a good thing. You can see on this chart, in this uh, red, orange, and blue, we have different purchasing managers indexes, like the one that we saw in uh, the U.S. Uh, we have the Eurozone, we have the European Union, and we have the J.P. Morgan Global Manufacturing, PMI. Uh, those are all generally rising, but you see how similar to in the U.S., 
there's some early signs of those uh, graphs turning over, of transitioning to that phase C, uh, which supports our expectation uh, and kind of asserts that what we're expecting about that slower growth period in 2018 is really going to be mirrored in uh, the international economy as a whole, which again, making up about a quarter of the world's uh, or economic production, uh, it's not unusual to see the international economy follow along with whatever trends we're seeing in the U.S. We can jump down to the next slide, Rebecca. Here you can see we have uh, a variety of graphs showing industrial production. The more green you are, the more positive, the more red you're negative. Again, we've already talked about the U.S. Canada is up 1.6%. If you're selling into Canada, that's a good thing. Uh, Mexico uh, is kind of a wash, just about even with the year ago level. Uh, there's a lot of volatility within a lot of markets, especially those markets in Mexico that are poised to sell into the U.S. border states um, as we watch what's happening with NAFTA. Um, if we do manage to renegotiate NAFTA in a way that's mutually beneficial with the U.S. and Mexico, uh, we expect to see those industrial trends picking up um, right in line with the industrial demand that we're seeing in the U.S. in the second half of 2017 and moving into 2018. We can jump to the next slide now. South America, more of a mixed bag in South America. Uh, Chile down about a uh, point and a half uh, year over year. Brazil in a relatively deep, prolonged recession. Um, obviously the Petrobras scandals, uh, presidential scandals, a lot of uh, politics in interfering with normal market activities, coupled with the turn down in uh, oil prices we saw last year that really hit Brazil hard. Um, take caution in Brazil. 2018 is going to be better for them, but you are not likely to see significant growth opportunities, especially compared to what you uh, enjoyed in this market in the earlier half of uh, the early 2000s. But you can see otherwise Argentina, Peru, Colombia, um, up between a half a point and a point and a half in phase B accelerating growth trends. Um, definitely some positivity in South America, uh, especially as we move up toward uh, that central region uh, and more of the countries that do some trade with Mexico. We can jump to the next slide, Rebecca. Uh, Europe, industrial production, you can see a lot more green here. Uh, France, Germany, UK, uh, most of Eastern Europe in general seeing uh, 1, 2, 3% year over year growth, very healthy, um, with a few uh, notable exceptions. Excuse me, I meant uh, Germany, not France. France, just about even with the year ago level, um, really grappling with some uh, restrictive labor laws. Uh, High, persistently high unemployment uh, and some currency competition from Eastern Europe. Uh, they do have some upside business cycle potential, uh, likely to transition into that light green sphere moving into 2018. Um, not necessarily uh, a period of significant economic growth though, like we'll see in the rest of Europe. Uh, also in the deep red, Norway, uh, again, um, having trouble recovering from uh, the commodity price shock and the downturn in the oil and gas market that we saw over the last year, year and a half. We can jump down to the next slide, which brings us to Asia, um, much more positive. Uh, you can see uh, primarily China up 6.5%. Um, as China goes, their neighbors go too. They are a huge driver of economic activity, not just in this region, but in the world as a whole. Uh, we've seen demand for steel and coal uh, increasing from China, uh, which does suggest that the economic activity they're seeing is sustainable, uh, as they really uh, do have their private and public corporations scrabbling for those base industrial materials. Uh, India, another one of the world's best performing um, Emerging markets up 4.1%. You can see Singapore up 6%, Philippines up 13%. Uh, Australia, again, just up 0.2%, uh, about even with the year ago level. And as one of the world's uh, largest producers of coal and steel, again, uh, the turn down in mining and the commodity price shock really hit them hard. But again, as their neighbor China starts to ramp up their demand, uh, we expect to see that uh, light pink move much closer to the green side of things in 2018. That gives us a nice little global perspective. I'd be more than happy to uh, answer more questions as they come after this. 
Uh, and Rebecca, we've moved to the final slide I have for you today. Uh, and again, this is a slide that I want to leave you with uh, that I've had up since the first half of the year. And I want to stress it's important. Uh, actions to take as a manager, as a purchasing manager, before the 2019 recessionary period. Again, primarily no. Are your specific verticals going to have a harder soft landing in 2019? If you don't know that, you cannot apply these bullet points. But once you learn where you are in the business cycle, where your specific verticals are moving with PMMI and us here at ITR, uh, you can start applying some of these concepts uh, and really position yourself to be an industry leader instead of an industry follower uh, as the market turns down in 2019. Uh, that's all I have for you today. Again, thank you for coming. Thank you for listening. Uh, and Rebecca, I am going to turn it back over to you. Chris, thank you so much for the great reflection of the current economy and issues at hand for the packaging and processing industry. Um, I'd like to open the session up for questions. If anyone has any questions um, that you would like to have answered, you can message them in the bottom uh, of your screen. There's a message chat box. Um, or you can press star 2 to unmute your phone. And we'll give people just a moment to see um, if we have any questions. Also, Rebecca, I'd like to take this moment to mention um, that if uh, any of your members or their colleagues have questions after the fact that they'd like answered, uh, they can email either you and have them forward them over to me and my team, or email ITR directly at questions at itreconomics.com, uh, and we would be more than happy to uh, do a little research for you and get back to you. Thanks, Chris. That was great. I don't think we have any questions at this time. Um, and like Chris said, if you do have any questions as a follow-up, please feel free to email Chris or myself um, or Paula Feldman with those questions, and we will get those answered for you. On behalf of PMMI, thank you so much for participating today. As a final note, you will receive an email to complete a brief evaluation on today's webinar. Um, please complete the evaluation as soon as you can to let us know how we can improve. Um, and also, this webinar will be posted on PMMI.org. And thank you so much to everyone who attended. Thanks, Chris. Thank you, Rebecca.